This video is sponsored by Aventon. The key to carbon neutrality is the massive electrification of our way of life. This means powering not just homes and cars, but every sector of the world economy with carbon-free electricity. But there's a problem. You see, not all sectors of our economy can be electrified. And in those cases, we usually need to burn fuel to produce thermal energy. This calls for clean, carbon-free fuel to burn. But where do we find it? For Japan, the answer is hydrogen. But not just any hydrogen, red hydrogen, produced by nuclear energy. What does that even mean? I'm Ricky, and this is Tuba Da Vinci. When you think of Japan and nuclear power, I'll wager that hydrogen isn't the next thing that pops into your head. Yet Japan is a world leader in both hydrogen technology and nuclear energy production. And recently they brought the two together in a technological breakthrough that has been decades in the making. Japan has been one of the strongest proponents of hydrogen adoption in the international scene, working to create hydrogen supply chains and developing the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle industry. They house the world's largest green hydrogen plant, the Fukushima Hydrogen Energy Research Field. However, clean hydrogen produced from renewable sources is very expensive and unlikely to be a cost-effective alternative in the next few decades. So Japan's energy policy regarding hydrogen seems somewhat like a gamble. Elon Musk even once joked that hydrogen-powered vehicles run on fuel cells instead of fuel cells. I don't want to turn this into a debate on hydrogen fuel cells. Regardless, Establishing elemental technologies for hydrogen production is still one of Japan's core green growth strategies to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, something the government confirmed just last year. So we've covered hydrogen before on this channel, links in the description. So I won't get too deep into the pros and cons here, but hydrogen has plenty going for it. After nuclear energy, hydrogen has the highest specific energy density of any known fuel, packing 33.3 kilowatt hours per kilogram. This is three times more punch in the same amount of mass as the best fossil fuels. Additionally, we can burn hydrogen to generate heat and use a fuel cell to generate electricity, in both cases releasing nothing more than water vapor. So it's carbon free. On the flip side, being a gas, hydrogen has a very poor volumetric energy density. So we have to compress it at very high pressures to make it practical. This brings all sorts of problems that go from storage and transportation to safety issues, none of which are trivial and which have helped make batteries and not hydrogen the key technology for the EV industry. But why does Japan seem so hell-bent on pursuing hydrogen? And how does this affect you and me? Well, here's the thing. We've entered a little bit of a technological arms race between battery electric and hydrogen fuel cells, and both have pros and cons. And different countries have chosen different sides. The Americans and Germans are really leaning into battery electric, but the Japanese and companies like Honda and Toyota have really not been too involved in EVs so far. They're really betting that hydrogen will be the winning formula. It's kind of like Betamax and VHS, right? A Blu-ray and HD DVD, which you pick could have long-term implications. And in the case of Honda and Toyota, Japanese car companies, they might not even be around if this hydrogen bet is the losing one. So there's a lot at stake, both for countries and companies alike. For Japan, one of the main reasons is that they're a very small island with few resources, but with a big appetite for energy. This makes energy security a big deal in Japan, especially after the oil crisis in the 70s. So they've been pushing hydrogen technology as a more sustainable and reliable option ever since. In that same period, they've also turned in a big way to nuclear energy. In fact, nuclear energy is at the core of today's topic, but not for the reasons you're probably thinking. We'll get back to that in a little bit. The future is going to be electric. The question is whether it's stored in batteries, hydrogen, or something else. For industries like aviation and cargo ships, maybe hydrogen has an advantage while batteries are dominant in passenger cars. But one industry where there is no contest is e-bikes, where batteries are just perfect, and where our sponsor this week comes in. This is the Level 2 Commuter e-bike by Aventon, and it's awesome. Let me tell you why you gotta check this thing out. It has a powerful 750 watt hub motor, good for 28 miles an hour and around 60 miles of range. You can use the throttle to just sit back and relax or dial in five different levels of pedal assist. I live on a pretty steep hill, so I love the in-pedal torque sensor that detects when I'm trying to pedal harder and ramps up the electric motor. Maybe you want to get a little more help and a little less sweaty on your way to work and then reduce the assist and get a great workout on the way home. And with awesome headlights and taillights, you'll be safe day or night. The front suspension soaks up the road and really reduces riding fatigue. Plus with a quick release seat clamp, my wife and I are both using it regularly. The hydraulic brakes and eight speed shifter give you that great confidence on the road and the controls integration and build quality are just top notch. The full color display is a joy to use and even lets you track your ride using the Aventon app. They have a full line of e-bikes, so there's something for everyone. In fact, I've been eyeing the Cinch 
foldable e-bike for its portable design as my next purchase. With cool optional accessories like the Burley Child Trailer, we now ride to things like our local farmer's market instead of taking our car. So save on gas, get a good workout, get some sunshine, and check out the Aventon Level 2 commuter bike today. Links in the description. Huge thanks to Aventon and you for supporting the show. The second and equally important reason is that many heavy industries like steel production, heavy transportation, chemical industry, and even the aerospace industries cannot run on electricity alone and require burning some sort of fuel, where hydrogen is the perfect replacement for fossil fuels. This makes hydrogen imperative to reach our global carbon neutrality goals. Take steelmaking, for example, which accounts for roughly 8-9% to of our total worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. A Swedish company called H2GS, as in hydrogen to green steel will use hydrogen instead of coal to produce steel and is set to start operations in 2024, producing 5 million tons of high quality steel per year with 95% fewer carbon emissions than traditional steel mills. Additionally, if used in the heavy transportation sectors, hydrogen could help cut down as much as 13-14% to 14 of our total carbon emissions. So clean hydrogen could help us cut down almost a quarter of the world's emissions, which is a huge step forward toward carbon neutrality. But there is a catch. Notice how I said clean hydrogen and not simply hydrogen. The problem is that though hydrogen itself burns cleanly, it's only as clean as the energy and processes we use to make it. And the sad truth is that 90% of the world's hydrogen, including Japan, is mostly made burning fossil fuels. As it turns out, even if we captured those emissions producing what we call blue hydrogen, this hydrogen's carbon footprint is actually worse than just burning fossil fuels directly to begin with. So how can Japan use dirty hydrogen and then have the nerve to say that it's all in the aim of decarbonizing by 2050? As you may have already guessed, there's still more to unpack. In essence, Japan needs a stable, if dirty, hydrogen supply chain to keep its industries growing until they find an economically viable alternative. And they did. So the first thing that comes to mind when putting Japan and nuclear energy together is a nuclear disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. Japan has been hit by its biggest earthquake since An records An explosion began. was heard and smoke seen at the power plant. The images of destruction and flooding coming out of Japan are simply heartbreaking. The disaster caused the meltdown and explosion of the reactor, releasing tons of radioactive materials into the atmosphere, displacing hundreds of thousands of Japanese residents, and unleashing a worldwide anti-nuclear energy movement. Here's the thing, when it comes to nuclear energy and also hydrogen, Japan kind of leads the way. After the Fukushima power plant disaster, many countries, not just Japan, really revisited and thought about their nuclear strategy and considered shutting down power plants. So when it comes to nuclear, how Japan goes, so goes the world. The aftermath really has affected all of us. In the United States, nuclear has been declining ever since, with 26 of the 96 operational nuclear reactors either scheduled to be or are already being decommissioned and only two reactors currently under construction. Japan closed down all of its nuclear reactors and was forced to go back to coal and oil to cover the energy gap. This doesn't get talked about nearly enough. However, the energy crisis caused by the war in Ukraine caused oil and gas prices to skyrocket, making the Japanese reconsider. And now, nuclear is making a big comeback in Japan, thanks to its cutting-edge nuclear reactor called the High Temperature Gas-Cooled Reactor, or HTGR for short. And its implications are huge. We've been testing HTGR since 1964, but only as small-scale experimental reactors or pilot plants. Yet HTGRs are almost the holy grail of nuclear energy. They could prove to be the solution to cut down a significant portion of our carbon emissions and make hydrogen a real game-changer that could rival lithium-ion in some market segments. But what exactly is an HTGR and how is it different than all the other reactors we have today? To answer that, let's put on our engineering hats and do a nosedive into the nuclear reactor. Okay, that was a very poor choice of words, but you know what I mean. Nuclear energy is pretty straightforward. All current reactors use fission energy from the breakup of heavy atoms like uranium and plutonium to generate heat. We use that heat directly or we use it to boil water and drive steam turbines and generate electricity. This reaction needs a neutron to start but releases three other neutrons, which leads to a sustained chain reaction that constantly produces heat and power. It's crazy hard to maintain and control this chain reaction without it running away and blowing to smithereens. The big problem is heat, so we need to drain it out as fast as possible to avoid the core from melting. The vast majority of the 440 operational reactors worldwide are light water reactors that use liquid water as coolant. But in the case of HTGRs, the coolant isn't water, it's gas. A gas, as in air-cooled? Now that I think about it, 
The HTGR is like the VW Beetle of nuclear power plants. Anyway, using gas as a coolant has many challenges because gases have very low thermal conductivities in the range of 0.01 to 0.03 watts per meter Kelvin at room temperature, an order of magnitude lower than liquid water's 0.598 watts per meter Kelvin, and also lower specific heats. Air has a specific heat of roughly one joule per gram Kelvin, which is a fourth of liquid water's 4.186 joules per gram Kelvin. This means that gases absorb heat at a slower rate than water and can hold less heat from the same temperature difference, making them less effective as coolants in general. But Japan's new HTGR reactor isn't cooled by air. They chose helium, which has an unusually large thermal conductivity of 0.15 watts per meter Kelvin and a specific heat at room temperatures that's actually greater than water's. While still not as good as water at heating the core, helium has more important advantages. We can heat helium to much higher temperatures than liquid water and since it's an inert gas, it won't corrode the piping. This allows us to operate the nuclear reactor at over 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, around 1000 degrees Celsius, compared to light water reactors that barely reach 600 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature is really important, not just for the production of electricity, but also for some of those heavy industries like steel we mentioned before. With adequate coupling technology, we could use this heat directly to power heavy industrial processes like iron making, oil refining, and even the petrochemical industry. In comes hydrogen. So to summarize, HTGRs are amazing, but what does it have to do with hydrogen? The answer is everything. Notice that several of the potential applications of HTGR heat have to do with hydrogen production. In the first place, HTGR heat is enough to drive the steam reforming processes used to make hydrogen from methane and other components of natural gas. This means we can use HTGR heat to produce hydrogen without burning fossil fuels. However, because gas reforming still produces carbon monoxide and dioxide as byproducts of the chemical reactions, hydrogen's carbon footprint is only reduced by about 40%. But there are two other hydrogen production technologies that require high temperatures that don't generate any carbon emissions at all, making the resulting hydrogen completely clean. Those are high temperature steam electrolysis, HTSE, and thermochemical cycles like the thermochemical water splitting iodine sulfur process. This is exactly where Japan's potentially genius plan comes in. They're the first in the world to attempt coupling an operational HTGR called High Temperature Engineering Test Reactor, or HTTR, with a thermochemical cycle hydrogen production plant. The HTTR test reactor achieved its first criticality on November 10, 1998, and started operating at its full 30 megawatts of thermal power on April 19, 2004. It was then successfully run for 50 consecutive days in 2010 at full power, with an outlet helium coolant temperature of 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. Everything was shut down and put on hold after the 2011 Fukushima disaster. But 10 years later, after passing all new safety standards, the reactor was restarted on July 30th, 2021, and has been operating at full power ever since. I didn't know that. With the HTTR in full swing, things start falling into place for Japan's strategy for carbon neutrality by 2050. On February 8th of this year, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries was commissioned to spearhead the nation's biggest bet on hydrogen to date, the construction of the first ever large-scale hydrogen production plant coupled to direct heat drawn from the HTTR nuclear reactor. The plant will use a new way to produce hydrogen using a two-step thermochemical cycle called the iodine sulfur or IS cycle. In essence, this runs two separate separate chemical reactions that produce hydrogen and oxygen and a third one that consumes water and regenerates the fuel for the first two reactions. So the only input is water and the only outputs are hydrogen and oxygen. Fun fact, many mistakenly refer to hydrogen production this way as pink hydrogen, but it's actually called red hydrogen as it's a form of high temperature catalytic splitting of water that uses nuclear heat as the source of energy. But why is this game changing? The significance of Japan's test reactor for all of us is threefold. It'll be the first time that we ever managed to produce large quantities of totally clean hydrogen in a constant, reliable, and economical way with costs far below green hydrogen. This could seriously change the game for the quest for carbon neutrality worldwide, as it could be the answer heavy industries were looking for to decarbonize their operations, something renewables, just haven't been able to do just yet. Secondly, these reactors can be built next to industries anywhere since they don't require vast amounts of nearby running water. So we could see heavy industries moving further away from power grids and closer to raw materials, lowering operational costs and further cutting carbon emissions due to less transportation. The third benefit is related to safety. Or did you think I was just gonna cut this video short without addressing something as important and meaningful for nuclear energy? 
Hydrogen and carbon emissions aside, I have to say the biggest and most significant benefit of Japan's HTTDR reactors is how it fixes one of the biggest and most notorious flaws of nuclear energy, the risk of a nuclear meltdown. These new reactors have a series of inherent safety features that make a nuclear meltdown almost impossible. And it starts with the fuel. HTTR reactors use tristructural isotropic fuel or triso fuel. This is made of tiny ceramic kernels with 6% uranium oxide covered with four layers of highly resistant ceramics. This encapsulation traps all the radioactive waste inside and makes it almost impossible for the waste to be released into the atmosphere, even in the case of an accident. But the best part is that these ceramics are incredibly heat resistant and require temperatures of several thousand degrees Fahrenheit to decompose making a meltdown almost impossible. Additionally, its high thermal conductivity coupled with a high heat capacity helps the triso fuel lose heat passively to the surroundings very quickly, which means that even in the unlikely case that there was no active cooling, like what happened during Fukushima, the reactor wouldn't melt down. So you're probably thinking, okay, that sounds great, but prove it. And I get it. In fact, I felt the same way, and so did most of the Japanese people. But you know what Japan did? They proved it. As in, they simulated catastrophic failure of the cooling system and control rods in an experiment while the reactor was operating at full capacity. Spoiler alert, it didn't blow up. In fact, it never even got close to the safety limits. The reactor fuel initially reached a scorching 2400 degrees Fahrenheit and then slowly cooled passively to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures this high would have spelt doomsday for any other nuclear reactor. Yet the reactor survived unscathed and is still operating today. The test results suggest that we could have Homer Simpson run the reactor and we'd be fine. Jokes aside though, we have a safety margin of at least one full week without human intervention and without risk of meltdown or radioactive contamination. Not bad at all. And if you're thinking, that's in Japan, what does that do for me? Well, a lot. The success is unprecedented and it could mean the return of nuclear power worldwide in all its glory, bringing clean hydrogen along for the ride. But of course, not everything's perfect and there's always a trade-off. First of all, while HTGRs almost completely solve safety, they still produce as much nuclear waste as the old technologies used to. So we still have to ask ourselves, how are we going to manage all that waste for the next couple hundred thousand years? Furthermore, we don't know if this technology and cost structure will scale as the Japanese are predicting, but we have our fingers crossed. So at the end of the day, this breakthrough is massive for two reasons. Japan has been moving away from nuclear since Fukushima. A lot of people don't know that, but Japan used to be a really clean country with a lot of nuclear power that turned back to coal and natural gas. But now this might be their way forward to bringing nuclear back online. As I mentioned earlier, so goes Japan when it comes to nuclear and hydrogen production so goes the rest of the world. So this really is a two-part breakthrough. The first is higher temperature nuclear reactors that are far safer than the water cool systems of the past. And all that extra heat can be used for all sorts of things like the production of clean hydrogen or maybe future steel production. And by combining the two together, the Japanese stance on battery electric vehicles might not look so foolish. But again, this is an arms race and this is just the next blow in the battle. So how will the future shake out for nuclear power versus renewables? And what about hydrogen versus battery EVs? Well, this is a big moment and the future is going to be more exciting as a result. And we will cover all the next breakthroughs as they happen. All right, so that's a look at the future of nuclear powered hydrogen production in Japan and why it's seriously a game changer. So if you like that video, check out this one next. We think you're going to like. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Ricky and this is Tuba Da Vinci.